I think there's a greater conversation about the NES that goes beyond what are just the good, bad, or relatively unknown titles for the system. In order to properly compare the games for the system in terms of graphics, fun, nostalgia, or influence, we need to consider when the games were released and the specific trends in the market at the time that in turn affect how we experience them. What do I mean by that exactly? Well, allow me to wax on here for a second. The Nintendo Entertainment System was first introduced to the American market in 1985, and Nintendo continued releasing titles for the system all the way up to 1994. During this nine year span, there were over 700 official titles released for the system. As someone who spends a lot of time collecting and dissecting this console, I think there are huge gulfs that separate certain titles. 1942 was a landmark shooter when it was released in 1986, but compared to a similar title, Gunnack, dropped five years later, they could have been released on completely different systems. Zen the Intergalactic Ninja is an amazing game, one of the best on the NES, but when it came out in 1993, the Super Nintendo was everyone's focus, and as such, less people played it than something like the first Ninja Turtles game. Alternately, way more people endured the masochism of Ghosts and Goblins, but not by choice necessarily. It was just the best option in 1986, when the NES was brand new. Removed from context, comparing Super Mario Bros. released in 1985 with Mega Man 6 released in 1994 would lead you to believe that Mega Man 6 was a superior game, and in every way we judge a game's worth, such as graphics, music, sound, and variety, it is. But Mario Bros. is one of the most important and innovative video games ever created, and the Mega Man series would have never existed without it. As such, to compare them fully, we need more context than just surface level appearances. And of course, the time periods in which certain games were released influences our own nostalgia for them. If you look up best NES games or some similar language, you'll probably find 1985's Kung Fu listed a few times. But how many mentions are there for 1992's Kickmaster? They're both great in their own way, but if we're talking about the best games, how can this continually outperform this? Well, many more people remember playing Kung Fu than Kickmaster, and as such to this day, it maintains a greater influence, fan base, and historical recognition. With all that in mind, strap in as I pretend to be a historian and bring some context to my favorite gaming console. In my opinion, the three eras of the NES break down like so. The initial launch from 1985 to 1987, the era of mainstream success from 1988 to 1990, and finally the wind down of the system from 1991 until 1994. So let's start at the beginning. The first group we're going to call the Black Box Era. Black Box is the nickname given to the 30 games released for the NES between 1985 and 1987, called as such because of the black background design they all shared. One of the perceived causes of the video game crash of 1983 was the use of somewhat disingenuous cover art used to sell games with graphics that rarely matched. When Nintendo entered the market, they designed these games to show exactly what the graphics were like. They may look primitive by today's standards, but at the time, these were way ahead of the competition. Nintendo was the primary developer in these early years, choosing to directly control the game output in order to combat the other perceived cause of the crash, quantity without quality control. By 1986, they began to allow other developers like Bandai and Data East to contribute a few titles into the mix, but only by following Nintendo's strict regulations and approval. By 1987, Nintendo was starting to move beyond the arcade style of game into more immersive and expansive gameplay experiences. This is when we saw the launch of landmark titles like The Legend of Zelda, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, and Metroid. It's also when the big third-party developers like Capcom and Konami stepped things up with iconic games like Mega Man and Castlevania. Just in two years, you start to see a huge jump in the quality of these games as coders start to expand the capabilities of the hardware. The second era of the NES began in 1988 with the introduction of the NES Action Set. This is when the Nintendo was bundled with not only the NES Zapper light gun, but also the most ubiquitous game in existence, the Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt Combo Kart. This greatest hits style release was many people's introduction to the system, and the time when Nintendo went mainstream. It's during this period that you start to see only a few in-house Nintendo titles release, including Zelda 2, Tetris, and Mario 2. At the time, Nintendo had shifted focus to the Game Boy, and left a lot of the production to third-party developers. And those third-party developers really ran with it, as the NES saw more games released during this three-year period as the other two eras combined. 
During this golden age is when many of the most famous NES games were released, including Contra, Dragon Warrior, Ninja Gaiden, Metal Gear, Double Dragon, Mega Man 2 and 3, Castlevania 2 and 3, Bubble Bobble, DuckTales, and many, many more. And that's not even mentioning one of the most influential games ever made, Super Mario Bros. 3. But of course, not every game released during this period was a classic. Nintendo loosened their grip a bit as the popularity of the NES rose, and a lot of awful cash grabs made it through the ringer. This is when you start to see a lot of the movie and TV licensed games come out, which, yeah, calling them a mixed bag is being overly kind. You could definitely still see some deep cuts during this era, mostly because of the sheer volume of titles being released at the time. Stuff like Journey to Silius, Crystalis, River City Ransom, and Maniac Mansion were all slipped in under the radar around then. Personally, this was my introduction to the NES. I knew older kids who had it during the Black Box era, but I was only three years old when it was initially released. So for myself and many of my peers, we didn't really hop on the Nintendo bandwagon until the late 80s and early 90s. For sure, most of my NES nostalgia comes from this era, but I think most people would agree, based on the games that I just mentioned, that this was the time period that offered the most. The third era coincides with the release of the Super Nintendo in 1991. Once the SNES had been released, it was the beginning of the end for the NES. Developers began shifting their focus entirely to the new 16-bit console, and consumers began to follow suit. This still took a few years though, and there were a ton of games released for the NES during this period. From a collector's standpoint, this is probably the most interesting era in the NES library because it's during this time that the most obscure and rarest games were released. Here's where you'll find the big 10, including Flintstone Surprise at Dinosaur Peak, Little Samson, Panic Restaurant, Bubble Bobble 2, and more. In fact, if you look at the 100 rarest NES games, you'll see that almost every valuable cartridge was released after 1991. The third era gets the least amount of attention, mostly because it existed outside of people's nostalgic wheelhouse. In 1992, everyone was playing Sonic the Hedgehog or Mario Kart, but who out there was rocking Bucky O'Hare or Gargoyles Quest 2? There were a ton of solid games released during this period, many of which are only now getting the attention they absolutely deserve. Most of the games I've covered so far in my NES Games No One Played series came out during this time, including Cool World, Defenders of Dinatron City, Hattress, geez, practically all of them. Obviously the Super Nintendo was where it was at, and few people stuck with the original Nintendo. I was actually one of these unfortunates, set adrift in a sea of NES while dreaming about 16-bit consoles like the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo. Oddly enough though, this kind of led me down my path of collecting for the system, and eventually this YouTube channel. While everyone was fighting over Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat, I was playing NES castaway titles like Power Blade, Kirby's Adventure, and Mega Man 4. So yeah, that's less of a comprehensive look at the Nintendo Entertainment System, more than it is kind of a brief essay on its lifespan. It follows a pretty traditional bell curve, and I think the same could be shown for pretty much any video game console. What's interesting to me though is what kind of games emerged during these various time periods, and how their graphics, gameplay, sound, and so on all differed. The earlier games were superior at the time, but were largely building off the single screen arcade style of their predecessors. The graphics and sound are a notch above Atari's, but compared to later titles, it's clear that the NES could allow for more growth. The middle era was the best of both worlds, solid music and sound with innovative and challenging gameplay. The system was at its most popular, and some classic and classically terrible games are best remembered from this time period. And finally, where the games were at their most technically superior, but many developers and gamers had already moved on to the Super Nintendo. There's a lot of quality in this era, but few of these games had any lasting influence because of their late release date. Anyway, this is the type of shit that I think about at 1am, trying desperately to fall asleep, but also giddily formulating these over-analyses of decades-old technology. Hopefully other people out there find it as interesting as I do, and if not, I may make more videos based on the three eras in the future, but let me think on it a little more. Until next time, thanks for watching. Heyo! If y'all like my channel and want to see more, I'm posting a bonus video every week at patreon.com slash words. Your support goes a long way and allows me more time to make more videos, so it's greatly appreciated. I'm also streaming a random game every Thursday, 9pm Eastern Time here on YouTube, so come by and hang out. And as always, thanks for watching.